Hey, hey, I am here with Mike Fisher. And if you had to ask me, who do you know that knows absolutely the most about VA loans? It's this guy here. Um, all around town, all the agents, whenever we're talking about VAs, Mike has built up a great reputation about what it's going to take to get a VA closed from start to finish. This is one area that there are so many misconceptions, even from agent standpoint, things that I thought I knew or I think I know about VA mortgages that I just don't. And so whenever I'm dealing with a VA, it's definitely getting Mike involved. Mike, thanks for uh, taking a few minutes coming on and trying to clear up some of the confusion around VA mortgages. Absolutely, Jerry. Any time I can get on camera or get in front of folks and try to help them move the needle a little bit when it comes to how much education is out there about the VA home loan benefit and how great of a tool it is for veterans to build wealth through housing, to, to manage their debt, and certainly to own a piece of that American dream. It's, it's just an awesome chance to help others learn where to go to learn themselves and, and how to be better and how we can all do just a few little things to help the veteran community out. So that, thanks again for the opportunity. I appreciate it, man. Hey, real quick, just to get started. So you and I go back 10 years now. Uh, I got in, I got my real estate license in 2013 and I was with 3DX at the time. You were the in, you were the in-house lender there. Uh, you had a great relationship with Mike. And so Mike introduced us and I am thankful for it because you've helped me out, you know, countless times over the years. And so how, but going, that's going back 10 years. How did you get started in the VA circuit like this and um, going down the road of just figuring out everything there is about VAs and becoming an expert in this niche? Well, I think there's a misconception in the marketplace that, um, a loan officer has to be a veteran themselves to be good at VA loans or that veterans should only go to loan officers that are veterans because they automatically know about the VA home loan. And one of the bigger challenges with that is that the VA doesn't really have an education department. They don't have a marketing department. They don't teach active duty or veterans about their VA home loan benefit much. So certainly when veterans come out and if they decide to be real estate agents or, or loan officers or in some way become involved with the VA home loan, they tend to take it more to heart and tend to learn a little bit more. But at the end of the day, they, they really don't learn unless they sign up to do the work. And I think that's the challenge in both lending and in real estate that a lot of people say, well, VA loan is a smaller piece of the marketplace. It's it's a niche. It's a smaller number of transactions. I'll handle it when I run across it. And they don't slow down and master the craft of helping a veteran with their VA uh, home loan benefit. So it just, it, I feel like it gets pushed aside a lot. And I didn't really realize this until uh, I'd been working with someone who was a Marine and he was out there teaching classes very similar to what I teach nowadays. And I started sitting through these classes. And in fact, I think you sat through one of them. I brought him in to teach it at the 3DX real estate office. And ultimately, he was diving into all these misconceptions. And we were like, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Holy cow. Mm -hmm. And I saw examples where there were clients who I'd worked with who I probably should have done a VA loan with. It would have been a little better for them financially but I had probably talked them out of it or not even realized that I could use a VA home loan. And I said, man, this is not good. Like I got to, I got to look at myself. And when I realized how much was being missed, I said, man, I got, I got to take this out there to the marketplace. I got to help other LOs get the message in. And at the time I was really active in social media. And I said, you know, we're going to take this whole concept of educating and teaching the realtors we're going to take it to loan officers and we're going to take it to realtors and we're going to blow it up on social media. We're going to turn it into more of a training program because there's so many misconceptions that are keeping veterans out of the marketplace. And it just, I, I became involved when I realized how bad the problem was, I guess is a short answer. Okay. That makes tons of sense. And that kind of leads into what my very first question was. And that is, are veterans generally well-informed about the housing benefits available to them? Well, veterans, when they come out of the military, you know, if they're active duty or reserve status, there's usually a class at the end of their term of service, a transition class, TAPS class, they call it. And that class 
does have a section where they talk a little bit about um, the home loan benefit, what the veterans might be eligible for. But if you think about it, like when you got a high school or college or, or trade school, or whatever you get out of, and you're going through and you're doing the work at the end of the program, like the last thing you want to do is, is learn more stuff, right? You just kind of want to check out and be done. So even though the VA tries to have a little bit of information out there, most of the time, the vets don't catch much in that class or the class not being taught by somebody in the lending or real estate industry. And they just miss so many things. So they end up going to the internet and clicking and trying to find out. And where do they end up when they do that? They end up in the marketer space. They end up you know, going to people that are just paying to market and paying to click. And it's not like those folks are, are always doing a bad job educating. But at the end of the day, their primary goal is usually to have that person do business with them first and then educate them later. So I think the veterans are a little bit skeptical of the online marketing just because they tend to be a very, very highly marketed to demographic. A lot of people go out there and say like, hey, we're the VA pros, we're this, we're that. Click here because because you know we love vets. And eventually, I think the vets, have, they sniff that out and they back off a little bit. And so, so they end up not learning. They end up not educating themselves because they're suspicious that everybody's just trying to make money off of them. So at the end of the day, they end up getting information, I feel like, from the community and from other people. Well, the community itself is is just got this huge plethora of misinformation out there. Some of it is based in fact, but some of it has just been handed down over, over the generations things like, oh, you know, the, the appraisals take too long and the lenders are terrible and all this kind of stuff. And you hear this, these things over and over and over again, and they're passed down through the veteran communities and from other folks from the outside as well. So, so you, you know, it's, I just think that the vets want to learn without the pressure of a sale or, you know, being forced to do business with someone. So I feel like they kind of back off from, from learning sometimes and they're not as well informed as they could be. Well, then you're talking about the TAPS class. They're also may not even be in the market for housing because they don't even know where they're going to land yet. Right now they're trying to figure out their pensions and where, how are we moving? And you know what, I have to be off base by this time and, you know, whatever, all the other things that are going on in their life. So I, you know, I know that people don't think about buying houses until it's, they're thinking about buying houses and that, that kind of drives. So that's the veteran side, the agent side. Here's where I see, because this is the world I'm in and having conversations with agents. I see so many things that either we just don't know as agents or it's just been spewed over the years. And so why might there be some hesitation or misconception within the real estate community regarding the VA? You know, I used to think before I really dove deep into this, I used to think the agents just didn't want to help veterans because I kept hearing like, oh, no VA offers and VA is not welcome on this house. And a lot of my lender friends are like, oh, these agents, let's, we got to go get them. And they don't like vets. And then I, I kind of backed up and I started having conversations with the agents. And I realized, no, they really do want to help the veterans, but they just feel like the VA product itself is not the best product for, you know, maybe for the seller of a home or for even the buyer, like, oh my gosh, this buyer is going to take forever to close. These banks can't sort out how to do this. They're going to tack on all these fees. You should use a different product or, oh my gosh, on the selling side, you know, the listing side, it's going to take forever to close. And the appraiser is going to nitpick this house and inspect the heck out of it. So some of these misconceptions are based in reality. And the more I dove into it, the more I realized it's really the lending community that has perpetuated these myths by not mastering our own craft. If we're really good at our craft, just for example, on the appraisal side, we order the appraisals quickly. We use the VA portal. We can communicate with the appraisers and the, the regional loan center, the VA themselves helps us a ton on that. But for many lenders, they don't do that many VA transactions, one or two a year. So they lose track of how to communicate, how to put the orders in how to get everything done. And so everything goes slower. So the perception for the agent is that as well, the VA takes a long time. But the reality is no, the lender isn't a specialist at VA. It isn't proficient at it. doesn't do a lot of them. So when they run into it, they slow down. And then a lot of times those lenders turn around and blame the VA. Well, you know, the VA, and man, like when I hear that, I cringe because that to me is a huge red flag. The lender is actually blaming the VA in many cases for their own lack of knowledge or incompetence. So I think the lending industry really needs to step up and get on board with a lot of uh, what's going on with the VA these days. The VA has put a ton of energy and effort into modernizing. And in fact, 
a lot of the other agencies, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, HUD, have copied VA policies ever since the, the meltdown years, 2007, 8, 9, 10. They've been copying VA policies on, you know, how do we do appraisals and how do we take the comps and and how do we we do all these things? Because they realized the VA actually had pretty good practices in place. So I think those misconceptions that are out there just come from mistakes that happen, lenders possibly blaming the VA and things not going smoothly that could have completely gone a different way had a lender uh, known how to work with the VA product better. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. So a lot of times the hurdle can be involved in that you have a veteran who's not sure, you have an agent that's not sure, and you have an LL that's not sure. And mm -hmm. so that's a lot of uncertainty in a transaction. And if you're on the listing side, like if I'm selling a house and I'm not confident in those three parties, then I'm not confident in the product. So it's not that I don't want to work with a veteran. I just don't want to work with that process or that product because I'm not confident that that's the best route for my seller to go. And my, my fiduciary responsibility is to my seller. And so I'm looking out for them as I'm giving them advice. And so it sounds like across the board, historically, we've had just knowledge issue or process issue. We just don't understand the process. Absolutely. And one thing I find, <laughs> and it's really important to, to bring it up, is that a lot of times veterans do go online and they click around. They end up going to lenders who use names or logos that seem to affiliate them with the VA when they're not really affiliated with the VA. And so, so they end up, unfortunately, at, at call centers. And a lot of times there's well-meaning, well-intentioned employees at these call centers that just want to you know, work hard like the rest of us. But a lot of the call center employees have shorter tenures, don't have as much experience don't get as much training. They're kind of thrown right into the sales pit to sell. And unfortunately, those kind of folks don't seem to have the local knowledge and don't always have the same ownership of the transaction to make sure it stays on track. And if a veteran goes to one of those types of setup and the transaction falls apart, the agents turn around and go, I knew that VA was a bad idea. When the reality was the <laughs> lender, like I was saying earlier in this conversation, was probably a little bit incompetent or, or maybe not on purpose. They just didn't have the, the proper skill level. They may have uh, proved somebody that they shouldn't have. They may have not ordered an appraisal when they should have. They might've just drugged their feet when they shouldn't have. And it, it, that's really a lender issue and not a VA issue. But I hear a lot of these horror stories coming out of the VA space from veterans that are working with that type of lender. So I always say who you work with matters. Working with someone who's you know local on the streets, heavily invested in VA transactions and knows what pieces and what parts are most important and critical to analyze right up front makes a huge difference on closing smoothly and quickly. Yeah. So I just Googled, you know, veteran mortgage and, you know, I just see, uh, you know, you get like who popped up, you get like Veterans United is the first, Navy Federal. I see Rocket Mortgage. They, I don't know when that switched, but I know they used to not do VA. So that must be relatively new, or at least when I got in the business, they didn't do VAs. And so all those are just large marketing companies. I mean, that's kind of where they drive. Is uh, is Veterans United affiliated to Veterans or is that just... If you look them up, their company name is actually a marketing name. They're a marketing company. Okay. EBA of a marketing company. Yeah. So they're certainly not affiliated with the VA or associated with the VA. They do a large number of VA transactions every year. They're in the top one or two or three spots almost every single year. They do a fair amount of education. Their website's pretty robust. The challenge I find with Veterans United is what I mentioned earlier. A lot of times they're bringing in younger loan officers and being young doesn't have anything to do with it, but maybe not as tenured, maybe not as experienced. And a lot of times I see veterans put out there with pre-approvals where they don't have certificates of eligibility in place. They haven't been properly vetted, if you will, like they haven't sent documents in to be reviewed. And all of a sudden I hear about, you know, challenges in underwriting or challenges getting the eligibility pulled up or unknown fees because they didn't properly review the total cost of the transaction with the veterans. I also find some of these companies, and I hesitate to to, to tag the names publicly, but some of them turn around and charge quite a bit of money to keep that marketing machine going. And so sometimes that extra expense becomes a big hurdle to getting to close where the veterans don't have enough money and they have to go get gifts and they have to try to restructure the deal and the agents and the veterans are scrambling to try to keep things moving. And oftentimes, like I said, when that happens, the lender is possibly blaming the VA and making it look like a VA transaction is not a good transaction. So that's part of why these myths per uh, perpetuate themselves in the real estate community is that you've just got these transactions that don't go smoothly that stick in the agent's head and they go, oh man, I, I you know, 
I tried a VA once. I tried working with this veteran a couple months ago. The transaction did not go smooth. But when you peel the layers back, you realize, oh, well, it didn't go smooth because the lender wasn't very communicative. The lender wasn't very experienced. And the lender was charging a ton of money and they didn't talk to everybody clearly about it up front because they weren't a seasoned pro. So everybody was kind of stressed and angry and the whole thing moved slowly and it was a death march. So yeah, I think it's it really is incumbent on the industry to be better, to communicate better, to be as straightforward as we can. I keep saying it, I'll say on this podcast, just who you work with matters. When veterans are out there trying to make a choice, clicking a button off of a search on the internet, you got to realize when you're clicking that button and you're, you're routing yourself through the, the World Wide Web, there's a pretty big cost to do that. And oftentimes the person on the other end is the person that's probably paid the least because they put a bunch of money into marketing and a full, you know, very little money training the person that was taking your phone call. <laughs> well, in our short time together so far, I think appraisals come up four or five times. And, you know, that was the thing when I was a young agent that was, you have to look out for the VA appraisal. It's a, you know, it's a terrible process. They're going to always have repairs and you're going to have to, you know, your seller's going to have to take care of some things. And so you're putting your seller in a bad position. That was always the thing. So what are some of the intricacies that the VA appraisal brings to the table and what kind of challenges can you expect or, you know, you know kind of just talk on the appraisal? portion of this. Well, I hear all the time about this, this mythical person, the VA inspector is going to come out to my house <laughs> and they're going to white glove it. Um, and let's just clear the air on that real quick. There is no VA inspector that, that doesn't exist. There, there's no inspection that the VA requires. The VA will require for any VA finance home, a VA appraisal and a component of any appraisal in the real estate community, whether it's a conventional mortgage, VA, FHA, is to look at the house and make sure that it's it's safe and, and secure and sanitary and a house that meets code that somebody could live in. And that's the main thought process of the VA. Let's make sure that this house is safe, sound, sanitary, secure. Those are the words that they use when they're giving the lender's instructions and the appraiser's instructions. So I think that's piece number one is that veterans and agents have heard stories about houses that may not have been in the best condition that did require some repair. One of the bigger repairs I hear about all the time is chipping paint, lead-based paint. That one's always going to come up. It, it's you know, it's going to be something that's got to be addressed. But I find that there's so much fear about it that it keeps folks from considering VA on houses that are almost brand new that don't even need any paint. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's the question that just as somebody's prepping a house and looking at a house, like, like ask these things up front, like, like what really is wrong with this house that would make you worry about it? And a lot of times I hear things that really aren't that big of a deal. I hear about tripping hazards and I, I hear about, you know, handrails and, and all this, this kind of stuff that at the end of the day doesn't cost a ton of money to repair. And in many cases, the VA doesn't even require repairs for. And this is where, you know, working with somebody that knows what they're doing makes makes a big deal or a big difference. The lenders that kind of are in the program, I run Veteran Mortgage Advisor, the logo behind me, they all know that we can go directly to the VA and the VA will help us work with the appraisers. Most lenders have never tried to call the regional loan center, have never tried to override an appraiser, have never tried to work with the VA on appraisal turn time. Uh, most of the folks in my program do it constantly all the time. We call the VA and we say, hey, we need help on this appraisal and they help us. So perfect examples of times where the VA would help you would be things like those ins quote unquote inspection related issues. Issues or, or really appraisal issues. So like tripping hazard, I was just at the regional lenders conference a couple months ago and the head of the entire appraisal division for the whole country was up there basically making jokes about tripping hazard. And he was just kind of laughing at how appraisers think everybody is running around the world tripping on everything. He's like, man, unless there's like a giant hole, he's like, we're going to wave that every single time. He's like, I'm so tired of this. I, I need to teach a whole appraisal class to the whole country. So that's an example of a leader of this entire government division telling the lending community, guys, call us and we'll wave this every single time. But the problem is, like I said earlier, the VA doesn't have a marketing department. They don't have a sales department. They don't really have a training department. They're not out there training the National Association of Realtors. They're not out there training the lending community that this tripping hazard is not a big deal. They're just telling a small group of interested people, hey, get the word out, get the message out. So that falls yep. on folks like me and you to tell the sellers and tell like, hey, don't worry about this tripping hazard. Worst case, yes, an appraiser goes off of some old rule from the 70s and says there's a tripping hazard. I call the VA and say, I need a, a waiver on this because this is silly. And the VA waves it pretty much every time. This is a perfect example. One other example I see constantly is that folks think VA appraisals always come in low and they don't come in at value at all. And oh my gosh, the, these appraisers 
just like to chop the value and make it hard. Well, when we look at the stats, when we go to the lending conferences, we hear that the same percentage of appraisals that come in low on other types of mortgages, conventional FHA, mm -hmm. are, are the same exact percentages that come back on VA. Like conventional appraisals came back at value 87% of the time. VA came back at 87%. Usually they're almost right in line. Sometimes the VA is a little bit ahead. Last year, the VA came back a little bit better than conventional. But either way, it's more of an appraisal issue than a VA issue. And what I like is that the VA gives us extra tools. Like I said, we can work with the VA to help get value if the appraiser is way off. We can override the appraiser and we can ask the VA to help us. And we call that a reconsideration of value. And we say like, look, VA, um, we don't think this appraiser is right. Here's our data. Will you just kind of look at this and pull the appraiser out of the loop? It's one of the only loan programs that allows you to do that. Most lenders don't even know how to do it. When I talk to the VA, they tell me like, like, hey, Mike, man, we created this process to help uh, uh, lenders and appraisers kind of come to terms on appraised value, but nobody uses it. Out of every 200 appraisals that come in low, only one gets submitted to us for reconsideration of value. And our turn time is like three to four days. Why is that? It's lack of knowledge. Who you work with matters. Working with a lender that knows these things and knows how to work the VA is super, super, super important, especially in the appraisal space. And Sorry, I'm just getting heated. I like no, to you're talk good, man. You're good. <laughs> and so, um, you know, one of the things that pops up is it, from an agent standpoint in the appraisal is you're worried about repairs and who's going to pay for the repairs. And there's this concept that the the veteran cannot pay anything, and that even goes for the pest inspection, which the VA in, in as far as I know, at least any of the products I deal with, the VA is the only one that requires a pest inspection. But yet we always hear that the veteran can't pay for it. So the seller has to pay for it. And I think in negotiating a deal that automatically put, if I'm representing the veteran, that puts us at a disadvantage when I'm telling the seller, oh, you have to pay for this just right out of the gate. Right out of the gate, who you work with matters. Because anybody who you know is versed in VA loans, certainly the folks that use the Veteran Mortgage Advisor logo, know that the VA completely changed change their stance on that within the last 18 months that anybody can pay for the pest inspection. Now it is, it is not a line item that the veteran can't pay no matter how the fees are broken up. A uh, veteran can always pay for the pest inspection anywhere where one is required. And I also find that a lot of times people don't even realize that the pest inspection isn't required everywhere. Like for example, Jerry, do you need a pest inspection in Genesee County, Michigan? I'll just answer that. No, you don't. And I still see agents from, you know, for example, Livingston County, Michigan thinking, oh my gosh, I don't want to accept this VA offer because it's going to need a pest inspection. Well, like at certain point you go far enough north, you don't need pest inspections. So the lenders that that you know work in the southern areas don't know the north and the work you know the lenders in the north don't work in the south and sometimes the veterans end up working with a call center and the call center doesn't know what they're doing they don't know the market that, that they're in they forget things you know like they'll forget oh i need a water test on a property that has a you know a private well because all the ones i do are in the city and they forget it and all of a sudden the transaction gets held up and they blame the va well you know the va like dude you should have ordered this in the beginning of the process you should have known about it because it's pretty pretty standard so so you Yes, I learned, that. I learned that one the hard way. I made the mistake. Right. That was me. You know, not ordering the water inspection. In there. Yeah, but it, the lender right. should should remind the agent about that. I mean, that shouldn't fall on the agent every time to know that. So, so yeah, that's that's kind of an example. Of just just yes, realtors that are listening and watching, it, it definitely pays to know this stuff and to be ahead of the curve. But man, the lender should be helping you with it too because it's a team effort, hundred percent of the time. I found a lot of times, you know, you're the agents are definitely on their own when they're when a veteran's working with you know these online companies that are that have call centers and. Um, portals and you don't have like a specific LO you're dealing with, uh, it gets a little, it gets a little Because yeah, usually the call centers, the loan officer is an order taker and they kind of pass you along, mm -hmm. if you will. Okay. They don't necessarily own the transaction from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. And that's when a lot of the problems come up. So you mentioned also the fees where the veteran can't pay certain fees. And that's highly, highly confusing subject for most agents because they, for example, work with one of these online lenders. One of them we might've mentioned earlier. Uh, I like, I don't like to say the names out loud much. I don't like to get in trouble, but some lenders charge a 1% origination fee, a cost of doing business, 1% of the loan amount. Well, in the VA world, when you start talking about things 
that they call non-allowable fees. Those start when you come up to a total of fees being charged to the veteran of 1%. So when a lender charges 1%, all of a sudden there's a bucket of fees that the veteran can't pay, things like the title closing fee. So I, I feel like a lot of lenders, again, who you work with matters, they could restructure the way they do transactions and, and maybe not charge these origination fees and make it so the vet could always pay all of their fees, which would make sometimes negotiating the deal as a realtor a whole lot easier. But at the end of the day, it's still, it gets confusing because the lenders don't know. Like, like you mentioned, the repairs, the vet can always pay for the repairs. The seller could pay for the repairs. I mean, it's negotiable. But the question is, how is it going to be done? When is it going to be done? Are the repairs required to get the transaction to close? Or are they additional elective repairs that they've negotiated from inspection that the appraiser probably doesn't care about as much? So the deeper you dive into it, the more I keep saying the same thing, who you work with matters. Uh, if it's if it's a repair item, for example, that's somewhat minor, like, hey, those windows up front are outdated. We think they're not going to pass code or you know, they're going to get flagged by an appraiser or whatever. The seller is willing to replace them, but the seller doesn't want to do that until the transaction closes. Well, there's a handful of ways to deal with something that comes up like that. You could just have the seller kick in money towards closing costs for the veteran and say, hey, we're going to give you three grand or four grand towards the rest of your costs so you can hang out of your own money and do the windows yourself. Or you can bid the windows out and you can hold the money back. They call it escrow for repair. Or you can kind of wait and see what happens with the appraisal and see whether the appraiser has a problem with it, which is kind of what I would recommend. And then and then go from there and decide what your options are. But a lot of times the lenders who are not as well versed in those types of transactions will just tell you, nope, this can't close at all until the seller fixes the windows. And that's not necessarily true. The VA will allow you to ask her for repair. The VA will allow you to work through items like this. But a lot of lenders just, they don't like to dive into areas that are not super simple and black and white. And so they tell the real estate community, uh, the VA does not allow. And again, a phrase I hate hearing because the VA absolutely allows what happens is the lender doesn't allow. That lender is allowed to make their own rules. They have the gold. And they said, basically... Well, the VA may say it's okay, but we're saying no. That's that's what I hear. But what they tell the real estate community and the veteran is the VA doesn't allow this. And so again, it perpetuates the myth that the VA is not a good product. And so they're saying the VA doesn't allow it because their origination fee is causing the fees to exceed what the veteran is allowed to bring? Well, yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's with the fees. Yep. And so you're saying... Uh, you've referred to that 1% origination fee. Like, is that on the high end? Is that the the cap that they can charge? Yeah, that's on the high end for the iPhone nationwide. Um, that is kind of the max, but 1% is, is kind of on the high end. A lot of lenders are charging between 1200 and 1700 In today's world, 250 to $400,000 houses, it's a half percent or less most of the time with most lenders. But if a lender is out there doing a 400000 transaction with a 1%, $4,000 fee, it's a little bit on the high end. Yeah, for so sure. then yeah, yeah. it gets to be... I, feel like a lot of times the vets would really do well to work with someone who slows down and explains how a loan estimate works pretty much line by line and also shows them the difference between doing a loan that has very low cost or a loan that has high cost. Typically a loan with higher costs would give a veteran a lower rate. Typically a loan with um, lower costs would have a slightly higher rate. And what you find is that consumers in general, and certainly veterans, you know, they want to get the lower rate. They'll gravitate to that. They'll click on an ad that shows that. But when they're working with a lender that is not communicative or transparent, they end up finding about all these additional fees that are charged to offer that lower rate. And so, like I was saying earlier, that can cause a lot of problems in a real estate transaction when all of a sudden the veteran doesn't have the cash or they're, they're frustrated and angry because the, the fees come in so high that it could either cause that 1% issue like we talked about or just an overall issue in the total amount of cash that they have. Well, that 1% has probably been in place for many years. And so if you look at, you know, even 30 years ago, you were buying houses for 70, 80,000. Now you're buying that same house for 250, 300,000. And so that 1% definitely changes the game a little bit. Yeah, exactly. And on a 70 or $80,000 house, it makes sense. It's a cost of doing business. But on a, on a $400,000 house, it doesn't cost most lenders that much money to pay an underwriter and a processor, maybe $1,500 or so. So I find that the lenders, like 
the company I work for now and a lot of the lenders that I'm friends with, they will charge the veteran no fees from the lender. And ultimately, in many cases, we might have a rate that's an eighth higher because of that, because those fees kind of get absorbed. Somebody has to get paid. But what happens is that if the, lend, uh, the veteran wants to buy a lower interest rate, they can pay what are called points or percentages of the loan amount to, to buy a lower rate. The points or the amount that they would pay in fees are charged what they call discount points. And those do not fit into the non-allowable bucket, that whole bucket of fees that the veteran can't pay. So all of a sudden, there's no more negotiation problem between buyer and seller, where you can just say, anybody can pay these fees. It doesn't matter. Back and forth. Let's just focus on the net to the seller. As long as the net to seller is good and we can close fast, let's move this off to the top of the pile, right? All right. So this is definitely a pick a topic that you can just uh, go on and on about. So let's keep this thing moving along. Um, <laughs> all right. What are the, what are the things in a VA mortgage that, you know, with the VA product that the veteran's not aware of that they're missing out on that you see over and over again, that they could be taking advantage of? Like, what are the, what are the features that, you know, we probably don't know about that they should be aware of, the veteran should be aware of? A couple big things that stand out. Um, number one, that the VA loan can be used more than once, um, can be used more than once at a time. Uh, I oftentimes hear veterans that just have been given the wrong information. They, they think, oh, I used my VA loan once in the past. I can never use it again. Or, you know, I already have a house with the VA loan on it. Um, I'm turning that into a rental. I can't use my VA again. And that's, that's just not true. We could probably spend 15 minutes explaining why it's not true. But at the end of the day, the VA allows veterans that have enough entitlement to use all of that entitlement. And sometimes it can go across one or two, or I've even seen veterans have up to three houses with VA home loans on them. Now, also, I feel like a lot of veterans are talked into different loan products and they don't realize that, for example, when they use their VA home loan, that really sets them up much better in the future for a refinance. The VA has a loan that they call the Interest Rate Refinance Reduction Loan, the EARL, which is one of the easiest refinance finance loans in America. Very rarely do you need an appraisal or employment verification or anything to do the loan. It's just simply, hey, here's a lower rate. Here's reduced fees because it's such an easy loan. And the VA even protects the vet. They say like the lender can't give us to you unless we're saving you at least a half percent. Here's some paperwork, sign and close. Well, a lot of times I hear veterans being talked into using a conventional loan. They say, well, you can just refi to a VA loan later. Well, the vet doesn't know that it's much more expensive, that it's going to be much more cumbersome to go from a conventional to a VA than it would be just from VA to VA. So I feel like that benefit of the, the simple refinance in the future when the market drops isn't talked about enough and, and is one of the things that vets really should know when they're deciding whether they should use VA or, or a different loan product up front. I got two questions that kind of popped up out of that. So if you're talking, they can refinance into this less expensive option. So right now, the big story or you know, everybody's saying, you know, purchase the house, purchase the house now and refinance later because, you know, and there's a good concept for this where right now our rates are a little little bit higher. I think last week there were eight, eight and an eighth, and I, I could be off by half a point in that. But, you know, most of the industry believes that the rate's going to eventually come back down. And so they're saying purchase now and refinance later. And the, the reason for that is right now we have a shortage of inventory, but if those rates drop down to five, five and a half percent, we're going to have even more buyers flood the market. And so right now is feasibly a time that's a little bit easier to purchase a house than it will be if the rates drop. So when you're talking about purchasing a house with VA and refinancing, is that a great example of how that could be used? Absolutely. Yeah. It's if the veteran uses that VA loan up front, mm -hmm. that refi is not that difficult. And, you know, like I said, the example of no employment verification, like sometimes folks worry, oh, I'm not sure if I'm going to refi because I was going to become self-employed. I was going to start my own business, you know, and I was trying to buy this house before I did that. Well, that's a perfect example where the VA was, isn't going to care as much about the income verification on the refinance. Another great example, folks always tell me about, you know, this real estate crash and how maybe it's going to happen again. And that's a whole nother podcasts and why I don't necessarily believe them, but let's just say that they're right. Let's say that, that they're right and, and rates go down. Well, there's no appraisal. So even if the house is slightly upside down, you can still refinance. If you do a conventional mortgage or an FHA mortgage, most of the time you need an appraisal. So if you need an appraisal and the house is upside down, refinancing is a lot harder unless they come up with a government program. So that that being in that VA product sets that veteran up for every opportunity to save when the rates go down. So I think it is really important to look at it from that perspective. The other thing that I, I see a lot of agents telling veterans, and I really feel like, like they don't understand the math. They tell the vets, oh, you should... 
conventional to get your offer accepted. And then you can use VA later. But the part that they're missing is that if that veteran goes conventional and then they go to VA, maybe they qualify. Maybe that's not a big deal. Maybe the house appraises. But unless the veteran is exempt from the VA funding fee, when they go to use that VA loan, in many cases, they're going to pay the VA cash out funding fee, which is like over 3%. It's a big Mm -hmm. number. So when the vets start looking at the numbers, they go, dude, I'm not going to refinance because it's going to cost me like $20,000. It's super expensive versus that interest rate reduction loan refinance I was just telling you about where the VA funding fee is only a half percent. So the math is completely imbalanced there. If you're refinancing from like a conventional loan to a VA versus a VA to a VA, that's the part that doesn't get talked about in the real estate community. So sometimes I feel like lenders and realtors aren't setting the vet up for refinance success in the future because they're, you know, they're having them use a different product. And they'll say like, oh no, we have to use conventional, even though you're putting less down. Don't worry about that PMI. You can refinance it later. And like next thing you know, the vet's like, oh my gosh, all these fees are here. Oh, and the VA told me I had to wait at least six months. I can't refinance in two months. I mean, like all these things that come up when you're trying to use a VA loan that just folks don't know about. So it's good stuff. The uh, second question that popped up is you talked about a veteran being able to have two, possibly three houses. So does that put them in a position to be able to utilize their veterans benefit to become an investor in real estate, either by flipping homes or, you know, buy and hold, like becoming a landlord and uh, owning a rental? Great question. And this is something we talk about all the time, you know, certainly in our veteran mortgage advisor program. And it's helping the vets understand what their options are with the VA home loan benefit that is most important. Now, if a veteran wants to become an investor, they need to know, number one, that the VA home loan benefit is for primary residences only. But does that mean that a veteran can't acquire a house or in ever rent it out? That's not true. The vet could have, for example, bought a house while they were serving, you know, on one of the bases that they, they were located at, lived in it for two or three years, and then retain that house and convert it to a rental. As long as their original intention was to occupy the house, to live there generally for at least a year and to really be using the house as a primary, if they decide to convert it to a rental later, then that's a great way for them to start building wealth. And we'll talk to vets about that all the time. Now, when they convert it to a rental, if they go to refinance that house, they got to refinance it as an investment property. Just like I was saying, Jerry, another great example to use VA because you could do the interest rate reduction refinance loan on an investment property. (laughs) Go figure. You can't, if you go back and use a conventional product and you're trying to refinance into an investment product, the pricing is drastically different. So again, the math doesn't quite line up. So, so that's piece one is letting the veterans know as far upstream as possible, even on their first house that they can potentially convert it to a rental. The other piece is letting them know that a veteran can actually buy a two unit, a three unit or a four unit, as long as they're occupying one of the units as their primary residence. So they could potentially be getting rental income from the other units and using those as investment income as long as they are purchasing as a primary. Now, the last piece that goes along with that is understanding that the VA isn't quite set up for folks to become landlords and to become you know, investment moguls, because what they'll do is they'll say, well, you could buy that first house and then you could refinance that out of VA. We'll restore your entitlement. We'll let you use it again. And we'll let you buy even more house, but you can only do it one time. They call it one-time restoration. And it's kind of tricky for me to do on camera here. I I could maybe pull up and do some numbers for you on another podcast, but ultimately the VA kind of limits folks to doing just one restoration of their entitlement so that they don't buy one, two, three, four, five, six houses. Because I've heard veterans say like, hey, I'm going to buy this house as a primary. Then I'm going to refinance it to conventional. Then I'll buy another one. Then I'm going to refinance it. Then I'm going to buy another one. I'm just going to keep going and going and going. And the next thing I know, I'll own 10. They're going to get pretty much stopped after the first time they do that. But what they don't know is that as long as what they're buying is pretty much in line with the county limits for the area they're buying with. They could have more than one property in the VA loan category. So like, again, it's public math, but like if somebody buys a $300,000 house and the loan limits are somewhere in the 400000 I'm sorry, $700,000 range, real simple math in my head. I'm like, oh, they can probably get another VA loan for 400 grand. They convert the 300000 to a rental. They buy another primary for 400. They do zero down on both the house they lived at on one base for a couple of years. Bam, now that's a rental. The other house they did zero down, bam. And that's a primary, they're in great shape. They could convert that other one to a rental and they could go use a conventional loan and just and just keep going. So yes, absolutely. Veteran can pr- 
prepare and plan, but they got to work with somebody that knows how the entitlement works. And they got to be really, really straight and clear with the occupancy. Like it's going to be a primary residence. Yeah. A couple of things come up either one, either you have somebody that's in the service still buying a house by where they live, purchase that house in a VA. And then that becomes a rental after they leave, because if you're purchasing by a base, there's plenty of people to rent to mm -hmm. um, eventually. So that where so you're falling into that house hack category that we investors always refer to as yep. plus as, plus all those renters they have they have housing from the military they have basic yep. loans housing like that yep. that housing money's coming in great renters perfect and then the second thing is that two to four unit and then being able to refi out of that and have a four unit you know once you're so you get out of the service um you're still trying to figure things out and you're not quite sure which maybe way your career is going to go or your personal relationship is going to go get into that four unit live in one you got three tenants refi out of that and then buy your primary and then you have a four unit in your portfolio forever and mm -hmm. that's a there's some great things you could do right there. Yeah, maybe do that before you got, you know, a bunch of kids and you're married and all that. But I was talking to a guy last year that did that. And man, he was just loving life because he had bought a property while he was serving, uh, you know, at Camp Lejeune in the Marines. And then he retained that and rented that out after his, his you know, four years there. And then he bought a four unit in Michigan, in Detroit, and he lived in that for a couple of years. And so he basically has two rental homes with with VA financing on them. And both were primary residences for a couple of years. But, you know, now, now he's he's got basically five different doors producing income for him that he did with his VA loan. Um, and he actually refinanced his four unit into conventional, restored his entitlement and bought another primary in West Bloomfield with his his entitlement. So, you know, it's just using all these quote unquote house hacks to, to build wealth and knowing how the benefit worked years in advance. And this whole thing for this particular gentleman was over the course of six, seven, eight years. But because he knew how the benefit worked, because someone slowed down and explained it to him, he was able to plan ahead, not necessarily put a ton of money down on these houses and waste all of his assets, but to kind of retain them and use those for his other business ventures and to let the equity and the renters paying a mortgage work for him. It's just a fantastic way to use the VA home loan benefit. Man, we could we could talk a long time about this stuff. Seems like there's always little rabbit holes that I want to go down to, but we're going to kind of, we're going to bring this home, wrap it up. So for a veteran, eager to jump into the process, you know, where do they need to start in securing a VA loan? Number one, any veteran that's looking to get ready to buy should get a copy of the certificate of eligibility. Make sure they got that. Make sure that they know that that part's taken care of. Generally, if a veteran was discharged honorably and they served active duty in the last few years, well, let's just say 10 years, it's going to be really easy for a good lender to pull that out for them quickly. We have an automated system. Most of the time we can pull it just with birth date and social and a few bits of info. Once you have that, you know for sure you're eligible for the program. So that's that's step one, I tell everyone. It sounds kind of simple, but man, I get horror story calls all the time for veterans that are a week away from closing. They still don't have that for one reason or another. So that's definitely step one. Step two, understand budgeting, how much cash you're gonna need in total to purchase. The VA doesn't take care of taxes, insurance, and closing costs. Sometimes a seller will, sometimes they won't, but you're going to have to plan and understand how much cash you might need. And then also your bu budget for your house payment. So that's where you're going to want to reach out to a lender, make sure you understand the numbers. And then from there, decide if you want to go ahead and get qualified. So you would have the lender double check your credit, give you some tips for optimizing that if it's not perfect, get some of the income and asset documents in just like we would do for any other person looking to get a mortgage. And then from there, get yourself a pre-approval and then turn around and connect with a realtor. Now, when you're working with a lender and a realtor, I find it super, super important to work with lenders and realtors that are going to do everything to get your offer accepted. They're going to present the best offer that a seller will accept because they've spent so much time educating themselves about the VA benefit, the VA home loan, and you know how to work through any challenges that'll come up that it's not a big deal for them to help negotiate for you in advance. And you know a lot of the realtors that are out there, certainly in the Metro Detroit space, have come to some of the classes that our community, the Veteran Mortgage Advisors have taught. Some of them have caught, come to more than one class like you, Jerry, you know, coming to these classes again and again, and you have folks on speed dial. That's the kind of real estate agent you want to align yourself with. And you want to ask questions of your realtor and of your lender. Like, hey, how many VA transactions do you close a year? What do you do to close them smoothly? What's your average turn time? Have you worked with some veterans in the past? Do you have some Google reviews from veterans showing that, you know, they'd like to work with you? All of these things are important questions to ask, but start out with getting that certificate of eligibility, understanding all your numbers, getting yourself pre-qualified, and then talking 
meeting with a great real estate agent about the budget and whether their houses in the markets you're looking at, they're going to fit into your budget. And that's great news, Fish. I really appreciate you taking the time to jump on. And if you guys uh, will put in the comments, uh, there'll be ways to get a hold of us and see some of the education that goes along with this. Any questions at all, you can hit up either one of us. We'd love to help you out. Thanks, Jerry. Awesome stuff. Appreciate it, man. Thank you.